Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Don C. I'm an alcoholic. And I was born into the Turtle Clan on my mother's side. I was born into the Coyote Clan on my father's side. And I'm a member of the Mohican Nation. And my Indian name is Tantanka Wambli. And um, that's how I was taught to introduce myself. But I always have to say I'm an alcoholic first. Because that's got to be above. The first thing that I remember, my first name that I can never forget, and uh, you taught me that. Um, second, I'd like to say it's really an honor for me to be here. Um, Todd has been, uh, we've got a good friendship going already. Um, we had some good talks, guy talks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was good, though. And, uh, no more got off the plane. We had right over to Doug's place and had probably my favorite food, chili and corn, uh, cornbread. Uh, and it was the best chili I've had in a long time. And I, I think I had about three bowls. I was trying to be really subtle as I went back to fill it up. But he said, make yourself to home. So I did. And uh, that was really good. So I want to thank uh, Judy and the committee for uh, asking me to come here, and uh, it's, it's actually just what I needed, a day full of AA. Uh, that was really, really nice, and such incredible speakers. Each one was, was really special, and I really liked the Alateen. I liked I liked how her spirit was, and her honesty and insights. You know, she's so young, and to have that wisdom, I was just really touched by her. I'm glad she got up here and shared uh, the thing I guess that um, I would start with is what you taught me. You say you just share your experience, strength, and hope, and uh, so that's what I will I will do up here. And maybe to share my story with this alcohol, I can probably easiest do it by sharing a story. And some of you know. Uh, a man named Don P. out of Denver. Um, he helped me a lot when I first got sober. And I'm uh, quite sure it was he that I heard this story from. I connected to it so strong, I told him I was going to take that story because it really made me put things in perspective. And uh, in this story, it talks about this, uh, back, this boxing match that took place. And there was this arena... And in this arena, there were a lot of seats in there. And uh, up in that ring, there was this one in the black trunks, and his name was Alcohol. And in the other corner was someone in the white trunks, and uh, that was me. And uh, like they do in a lot of sporting events, they put a little ribbon. They say that front row of seats, that's special. That's so your family can get the best view of what's going on. It's a special place that they can set. And so as that match started, there were a lot of people in that arena, it seemed like. And they had sectioned off that part. When my family came in there, they went and they sat right in that front row so they could see a good view of what was about to happen. So the referee got us both out there and got us together and this referee explained the rules between me and this alcohol and when the rules were done we both agreed we knew what the rules were and so we went back in our corner so pretty soon that bell rung and we come out and we started this fight me and that alcohol in the first round or two it wasn't it was alright we danced around and boxed back and forth a little bit and there was no nothing too much happened. It was okay. So I come out there for about that third round and 
kind of surprised me, but that alcohol snuck in a lucky punch and just kind of stung a little bit. And uh, I kind of jumped back and the alcohol looked at me and he said, oh, that was just a lucky punch. And I looked at that alcohol and I knew it probably was because I had a lot of willpower and things like that. So the bell would ring, we'd sit down and then out there a couple more rounds and pretty soon the alcohol is punching harder. It's getting more lucky punches in. And each time it got that punch and kind of stung me a little bit, the alcohol said, that was just a lucky punch. The alcohol says, you can whip me. And I looked at alcohol right in the eye and I said, I know I can. I knew that I could. But a round or so later, it got kind of boring, I guess. And pretty soon all the people, they started to leave. They just were walking out of it. But I was focused on the alcohol. Because I, my family was there watching. You know, I had to do a good job there. So we got out there and then pretty soon that alcohol was punching faster, harder. And then pretty soon I noticed everybody was gone. And when I come back and I sit down in that corner and after the bell rung, my son come up there. And he said to me, he said, he said, Dad, he said, let's go. He said, you're not, you're not winning. You need to go. And I looked at him and I said to him, I said, just one more round. You watch this one. I'll show you. I'll do it this time. So that bell, bell rang, and we went out there, and right away, alcohol started really punching hard. And it kept telling me, it's a lucky punch, you, you can whip me. And I knew inside of me, I had this feeling, and I knew that I could whip that alcohol, but it was stinging pretty bad by now. So that bell rang, I went to sit down, and as I sat there trying to figure that out, my daughter came up. And she tugged on my arm and I looked down at her and she said, Dad, she says, Mom said to tell you that if you don't leave with us, we're going to go. And I said, you tell your mama just one more round. Just stay here and watch one more round. So I got out there and I was fighting with that alcohol and I'd, I don't remember for sure what part of that round that they left, but they did. And I went and I sat down there and they were all gone. That row was empty. And I looked over at that alcohol and it was so appealing. You know, he had that look. And I thought I could overcome it. So that bell rang. I went back out there and this time alcohol started kicking even. And that wasn't in the rules. We're not supposed to hit below the belt, but the alcohol wasn't listening. And then pretty soon by that round, I was on my knees looking up at the alcohol and it kept telling me, you can whip me. And I kept thinking, I know I can. I'll do it. You watch. So I crawl back to that corner and the bell would ring. I'd crawl out there. This time the alcohol was stomping on my head and on my back and kicking. And I was on my stomach this time, crawling out there, just looking at his tennis shoes. And the alcohol was screaming, you can whip me. And I looked at the alcohol's tenor shoes and I said, you know something, the alcohol's lying. I said, I think I got it. I can't whip this alcohol. So I didn't wait for no bell. I just turned and I crawled out that ring the best that I could. And I left that arena and I got out there and I started to heal some. And as I got healing, I got thinking to myself. As I felt a little bit better, I said, you know something, I think I know another trick. I says, I think I'm going to go back there one more time. So I walked back there the next day and I walked in that arena and their alcohol is standing up in the corner with this box of matches around that rope. And I said, alcohol, I said, I'm back. And the alcohol looked at me and I said, I, said, I knew you would be because you think you can whip me. So I went right in that arena right away. And it wasn't like a 10 round fight this time. It was right away. It happened right away. First punch down on my stomach. Alcohol would just keep kicking and that. So I looked at his tennis shoes once more. And I crawled out of that arena. And I healed some more. Then I got thinking, I said, I think I know another trick. 
I'm going to go back in there one more time. And that's what I had to do. I went, I kept going back in there, even though the proof was there. Everything was gone. But the, the last time I was looking at the alcohol's tennis shoes was August 10th, 1978. And I was able to fully concede to my innermost self. I was powerless over this alcohol. And so I left that arena and uh, I knew, I knew where to go. I knew I had to come to you. And so I knew where this AA meeting was, downtown Colorado Springs, and I went down there and it's kind of an old building, there's these steps went up. And I drove by that <clears throat> front door and there's a parking spot right in the front. And I said to myself, I said, I'm going to circle this building one time. And if I come around that parking spot, it's still there, then it's a sign I'm supposed to go in there. <laughs> and there was a lot of cars, you know, people were coming right for the meeting. And so I drove around that block and I come around there and darn if that spot wasn't still there. So I drove really slow and I said, okay, I'm going to go around the block one more time. And I said, if that spot is still there. I drove real slow. Going around that building, sure enough, I come around there and that spot was still there. So I went in there. And uh, those days I come into uh, AA, I was kind of a, I come from a reservation and I, I didn't know how prejudiced I was, but I was a prejudiced person. And I walked into that room and who was sitting there? It was all white people sitting in that room. And I thought, oh no. I gotta come here. I said, I don't know if I'm gonna like this or not. And I sat there in that first meeting. And I wouldn't say nothing. I wouldn't say my name's Don, I'm an alcoholic. I wouldn't say nothing. I said, I ain't telling them nothing. I'm gonna just sit here. <laughs> so I sat there for that meeting and you know my time come and I didn't say nothing. They waited a long time and pretty soon they just went on. But there was something that happened at the end of that meeting I did that I really didn't like. In that meeting, I didn't like how much they were laughing. God, they would just laugh and laugh and laugh at stuff. Another thing I really hated is they, they were telling on themselves. They would, t they would tell stuff. I wouldn't tell nobody nothing. Like what they were saying, it right out loud. You know, they were saying that. But there was something about that. I thought it bothered me. I just couldn't think about why would they do such a thing? Just dumping their guts, it seemed like. And then laughing like heck out of it. <laughs> so, when I come back to AA that last time, I was ready. I didn't have any resistance when I came back. But I knew I knew I was supposed to get a sponsor. I knew I was supposed to go to meetings. But alcohol took any resistance out of me. When I came back, I didn't resist nothing. I'm telling you, I was ready. And so first thing I knew I needed to do is I had to go get me a sponsor. So I was watching this guy. His name is Frank. They call him Big Frank. For, that's kind of his nickname. You know, they got West Side Gary. And, no, <laughs> but they call him Big Frank. And so I went and I asked him if he would be my sponsor. And he looked at me and... Uh, he said, well, let's go down and sit at this table. He said, we'll talk about it. And, uh, this Frank is a, he's a very big man. Probably would guess maybe six, 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 seven, something like that. He's big. He's a big guy. And he's a real alcoholic. He's all scarred up, you know, his face. Something happened to it, you know, when he was drinking or whatever. And he, uh, he's got really squint eyes and he's, at the time, uh, I would say he has tendencies to be sarcastic. He, he is able to do that. So we sit down at that table and he's uh, squinting his eyes and he's got his lip that hangs out. You know. He was just looking at me, you know, and he said, um, he said, you know, I said, I've been in this program, he says, for 15 years. He says, I watch you Indians. He said, you just come and go. He said, way in the back, you see, you don't say nothing. He says, you know something, I don't know what it is. He said, but most of you guys don't make it. He said, I never seen a sober Indian, actually. He said, a couple of months like that, maybe. But he said, I don't know what's, 
what it is, he says. You, there's something wrong with you guys. <laughs> and uh, you know how you, you, uh, you ever have, like, when you're a kid, you'd have, a, like, a little puppy, and you'd tease that puppy, you know, you'd, like, you'd rub its face like that, you'd rub its face like that, rub it some more, and that puppy starts to growl. That's how I felt he was doing. He just, you guys don't make it. You guys don't make it. And I remember he was doing that, and I sat across that table, and inside of my mind, I looked at him, and I thought, I'll show you, you white son of a bitch. I'll make it. I'll show you. But, but, but later on, I found out, you know, in his wisdom, about the only thing that I had, that he had to work with was my anger and my hate. I didn't have compassion or understanding. I didn't have none of that. And so he used what I had a lot of. And he just he made me mad. He kept me mad at him. You know, I was trying to show him, you know. But he knew how to do that. But then he, uh, he said, uh, he said, you know, he said, this program, that Alcoholics Anonymous program, he says, it's out of a book. And then he opened up that book and he showed me how many pages was 164 pages. He said, this is what the program is. And he says, what you're to do if you're to work with me, he said, you're to, you will bet your life. You will bet your life that if you do what's in these 164 pages, he said, you will never have to drink again. This program is about dying sober. And I'd never heard that before. He said, this program isn't about slipping. It isn't about that. He said, this program is about never having to drink again. And, and then he said, just so we get this contract between me and you, the sponsor is, he says, first of all, he says, there's some things I'm not. He said, one thing I'm not, he said, I'm not your taxi cab. Don't be calling me up for a ride. You got to the bars without me, you can get to the meetings without me. <laughs> he says, second, I ain't your motel. Don't be coming asking, can you stay with me? The answer already is no. He said, that's not what I do. He said, I ain't your banker and... I ain't your daddy. He had this whole list of things that he wasn't. He said it. But he said, there is one thing I will be. He said, I will be your friend. And he said, it has nothing to do with you. He said, I just decided right now, I'm going to be your friend. He said, it doesn't matter whether you like me or don't like me. Rest your life. He said, I'm going to be your friend. That's just the way that it is. And he said, there's other couple other things I can give you. He said, one thing I'm going to give you is hope. He says, because whether you like it or not, he says, I'm 15 years sober. And he said, you little brown son of a bitch. He said, you can't stay sober. So I know something you don't. He said, and that's hope. <laughs> and then he said, the other thing I'll do is I'll share some experiences with you. He said, and there's a couple ways you can learn. I can tell you some of the stuff that I did. And if you do it, it will work. He said, and I can tell you about 75 things, how not to do it. He said, I ain't figured that out yet. But if you don't have to do those 75 things, then he said, I'd save you some time. <laughs> and so, he said, we only work together because we want to. He said, you don't, suppose you don't want to work with me anymore. He said, you don't even have to tell me, just don't show up. He said, suppose you, my hair is parted in a way you don't like it. He said, you wouldn't have to work together. He said, it's the same way, the other way. I, maybe I don't want to work with you. He said, we work together because we want to work together. You don't have to do, do this. And so I told him, uh, you know, I would go along with that so far. So then next he opened up that big book and he showed me where his 12 proposals were. And he said, you're to read each one of these steps. He said, just read step one. And he said, you're to answer two questions. One is, he said, do you want to work this step? The second question you're to ask is, are you willing to go to any length? Then you go to step two. You want to work it. Are you willing to go to any length? And then step three. Each one of those 12 steps. And I remember that night that he was telling me about this. I was over at his house and he was making some uh, sandwiches for us. 
And he says, see, he said, the reason we do that is he says, you don't have to work the steps to stay sober. He said, half AA, people work the steps. He said, they don't work the steps and they're sober. He said, you don't have to do it. He said, a lot of them don't work no steps. They just go to meetings and he said, somehow he said, they stay sober. But he said, AA is like a banquet, like a table, you know. He said, at one end you got like lobster and T-bone steak and then further on down it decreases to maybe meatloaf. And, and when he was telling me that, he was making me this peanut butter sandwich. I like peanut butter. You know? <laughs> he was making a sandwich. He said, down there there's cheeseburgers and down there. And then he said, there's even such a thing. He says, this, and I was eating a sandwich by then. You know, he said, there's even such a thing as peanut butter sobriety. But he says, the problem with that peanut butter sobriety, he said, that peanut butter sticks to the roof of your mouth. And he went, you know, he's making fun of me that way. And I remember later on, every once in a while, I see them in a meeting. You know how you see your sponsor in a meeting? You, know? you can tell they are trying to connect to you, so you try to not look at them. You know? like and then the more you try to not look at them, you have to look at them. So I look over at him, you know, and you look at me and you go... <coughs> just rubbing my face like that. So anyway... I went and I did what he said. I looked at those 12 proposals... And when I got to that 12th one, I went back to him and said, I want to do this. And he said, and you're willing to go to any length? And I said, yes, sir, I am. I'm willing to go the distance. So then we got that big book. And uh, I had read that book before. But before, it was the most boring book I ever read in my whole life. There was talk about these instructions are in the big book. I could never find those darn instructions in there anyway. <laughs> you know, I thought there's like a page that says instructions, and then it, but I found out it wasn't there. And so he started and he said, you're to read the first 43 pages of that book. He said, that's his instructions for the first half of step one. And he said, it's my suggestion that you read that about 25 times because he said, you got some problems there. <laughs> he said, read it. Then he gave me a schedule of the meetings in Denver, Colorado. And he circled six meetings of which I was to attend. The seventh night was my night of choice. So he circled a big book meeting, step meeting, tradition meeting. And he said, you go to these meetings. And he said, you say, my name is Don. You say you're an alcoholic, and then he says, you just shut up, because you know nothing. You've got nothing to share. You don't know nothing about staying sober. He said, you don't say nothing. So I went there, and that's it. But I did. I went there and said, my name is Don. I'm an alcoholic. But this one particular night, I, I went to this meeting, and uh, I guess I was sober maybe about six months or so. And I sat there, and this woman walked in there, sat right across that table from me. At home, we got a word called snagging. And they have that, this is a snagging look. And she was giving me what I interpreted to be a snagging look. I think she was interested in, you know. <laughs> so I was watching her kind of out the corner of my eye, and I think, you know, I said, I'm not going to make any progress unless I can quote the book or something like that. So I said, I think what I got to do is talk tonight. So. It come my turn to talk, and so I quoted that big book right off the top of my head, and a big smile on her face. You know, I could tell. <laughs> it was looking good. So then I, I got done with that, and we had a cup of coffee even, you know, over at Village Inn or someplace, and I went back to this little apartment that I had in Denver. And I wasn't in that door ten, ten seconds of phone rings. And I pick it up. I, I was happy, too. Was, Hello. <laughs> Who was it on phone? Frank. <laughs> what the hell you doing talking tonight? You know. <laughs> you know, sponsors are like the original internet. You know, they just do that for everyone. So I got caught. <laughs> so anyway, I started to read those pages, just like he said. And he said, now when you go to a meeting. He said, no matter what that meeting is you go to, you listen to it from the point of view of the step you're on. You go to 11th step meeting, you listen from step one. 
Go to traditions meeting, you listen from step one. Always from the step that you're on. He said, you have no other steps. He said, and you can't be between steps either. He said, you're either on one or you ain't. And so that's what I did. And that was pretty simple. I, I really needed to do it that way, just to listen from that and read that book. And I started to understand a lot better what it was I was supposed to do. So I went back and I had to always talk to him at the end of that step. So we got done with that. We went to the second half of step one. And he showed me a paragraph on page 52 of the big book. And he said, this is where the instructions are for the second half of the first step. And he showed me this paragraph, and there were some sentences in there. And it says, we were having problems with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional nature. Talk about misery and depression and fear and making a living. And he said, you take those statements and you flip them into a question. And you're to look at the unmanageability of your personal relationships. And he said, when you look at that, you don't look at what's wrong with that relationship. He said, you look at that relationship. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's some of you work with. But when you look at that relationship, you've got to look at your part of it. When you're in a, He said, you just observe that relationship. And then you've got to say, now, how are you acting in that relationship? Are you stuffing things? Do you get resentments? Do you go drink? Do you get even? Do you gossip? You've got to look at your part of that. And so I started to look at my personal relationships, and the first time I began to see why my relationships were unmanageable, I didn't see any signs of anything that did not create chaos. There was nothing. I was a manipulator and a bullshitter, and I could just see, I couldn't see any success actually. I could see the con. And I could see I'd leave that one and I'd just put another mask on and do the same thing. And then I looked at my emotional nature, anger. When you're in anger, it's not anger, but how are you acting when you get angry? Do you run? Do you shut down? Do you get even? And all the way down, I had to look at all nine of those areas. And as I looked at those areas, I began to see for the first time why my life was unmanageable. I didn't know. I didn't know how to get along with people. I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know how to be honest. I lied. That's how I did it. And so when we got that done, and he took me to that chapter, We Agnostics. And he said, this is instructions for step two. And so I had to read that many times. And when that was done, he taught me how to take those nine areas. He said, these steps are all interconnected. They're not separate. But they're in the natural order. That one helps you do the next, do the next. You can't skip one and do, it won't fit. It won't work. And so then I was shown to take those nine areas and I was to create a vision for step two. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Soundness of mind, that word means. So I said, take a look at relationships. And I was to ask myself this question, take this, make this vision of relationships. How do you th- how do you think the Creator would have you be in relationships? Not how do you think your relationships should be, but how should you be if you were in that relationship? No matter what that relationship did or not, you're part of it. How? And do you think that power exists once you get that vision to allow that to come true? Not, not how is that power going to do it, not when, just the possibility. And so I made this... Vision in nine areas, personal relationships, emotional nature. And so I went over that with him. And he said, that vision that you create in step two, that becomes your spiritual awakening in step 12. He said, that's why the step says, having had a spiritual awakening. If you want to get an idea what that spiritual awakening is, look at that vision that you create in step two. That's why it is. And then later on, I learned these other principles that you move towards and become like that which you think about. And if it's true that you move towards and become like that which you think about, is it important to think about what you're thinking about? And then he said that vision, then, when you work the rest of the steps, is working on removing the blockages to make that vision come true into your reality. And so I created that vision And then we went on to step three. And he showed me the instructions in the big book where that step three is. 
And he said, that book is full of instructions. And he said, every sentence in there is an instruction. So as I was to study that big book, preparing for step three, that instruction, being convinced that our life is run on self-propulsion. Then he says, you stop and you think about it. Is that true about your life? Go back to your experiences and see, is this is what you're doing? And when I said, you're an actor, I had to stop and think, am I an actor? Do I try to control the show? And all of those things, one at a time, I had to go through and apply them to my experience. I had to sit and think about that. Is that true? Are you even conning when you're trying to be nice? Are you self-seeking even when? And I began to see what that step was about then. And as I was getting ready to take that step, I had some fears about the third step. And whoever's wisdom it was to put that God as you understand him in there, I thank God that those words were in there because I don't know if I could have stayed. I was raised on a reservation and uh, I had a lot of different perceptions about God. Uh, I was raised by my grandpa. He's kind of a traditional man, but they had these reservation schools and they had mission schools. They used to come there all the time, the missionaries. They would come there. We only had like two buildings there that would be one church or the other. And so what they always offered was like food and clothing. That seemed to be a thing that, that they did when the missionaries came there. And so, But what they always did is they wouldn't give you the food or clothing. First they'd make you go to church first and then you get the food and the clothing. You know, so you... One church would come in there, and then you'd be going like this, you know. We taught how to do that, and then we would eat, and then pretty soon they'd run out of money, and the next one would come in there, and then you'd be going like this, you know, and then you could eat. And sometimes they'd have the schools, you know, you have to go to the religious schools. And uh, you know when you're a little kid, you grow up. I remember for a while I went to this uh, Catholic school missionaries that came up there. And, uh, it's hard to imagine like when you're really little what a nun looks like. They're huge. <laughs> you know, and the way that they dress and they got those wire glasses, you know, and they... Why? Well, and then, you know, like sometimes in front of them we speak our own language when we want to talk about them, you know, in our own night. You could hit with a ruler, you know, if you spoke like that. They... they uh, my perception that I remember. It was, it was quite an experience, you know. And the thing that really mixed me up is like, first, these missionaries would be there, and they talked about heaven and hell, and you had to do certain things to get to heaven, certain things to go to hell. Well, they would leave. Well, then the next one would come in. Then they would say, well, if you belong to that group, you're going to hell. This is the group, you see, that gets you to heaven. Now, I remember they painted this picture of hell. I, I remember... You know, these nuns, it's like they would say, uh, they say, you ever been burned with a, with a match or a cigarette? Well, yeah. They say, in hell, your whole body's going to burn full of blisters. You know, you're a little kid, you go, ah. <laughs> Does you ever been thirsty? Well, there ain't no water in hell either. <laughs> You'll be full of blisters and your body's going to be and I remember it. They say, you want to see God? You go, oh, yeah. But it's like you have the flames of hell licking your ass, you know. Going, oh, I better see God. So then by the time I got here, you know, that's why that sentence was important. It was God as you understand him. Because if I had to use that one, you know, I don't know if I'd make it. So I was kind of arguing with myself, um, trying to get convinced about this third step. And I was in a meeting one time, I heard this guy tell his story. And I don't know why, it just clicked for me. And this is what made me want to take the third step and be willing to go to any length. But he told his story, he said, there's these four frogs sitting on a log in a pond. And he said, one of those frogs made a decision to jump in the water. And he says, how many frogs is left on that log? Of course, I said three. He said, no, there's four. He said, the difference when you take that third step is when that frog decides to turn its will and its life over to the care of the Creator, God. He said, what God does is He makes that frog orange. That's the difference. Three green frogs, one frog made a decision, now it's an orange frog. He said, that's the difference. It ain't done nothing, just made a decision. 
But he said, you hear a lot of times in a program where well, I turned my will over and then I took it back. And I turned it over and I took it back. And turned it over and took it back. Turned it over and took it back. You know? <laughs> he said, that's not how that step is about. He said, once you become an orange frog, it's a done deal. He said, what happens if you t- become an orange frog on Monday and you get angry on Wednesday? He said, you're just a pissed off orange frog. <laughs> You see, what happens on Saturday if you go get drunk? You're a drunk orange frog. <laughs> and where my mind was, I understood that perfectly. <laughs> and I went over to Frank and I told him, I want to, be- I want to become one of the orange frogs. Just... <laughs> but anyway, we sat there that night. We went through those instructions, every one of them, every sentence. He asked me to share my experience with him because he wanted to know if I knew how. And she said, that book is about me. As an alcoholic, I needed to understand how to recover. And so we went through that, and then me and that old man, we got on our knees in his living room, and we each held that big book. Held hands with that guy, too, I did. And he read that third step prayer, and I read that third step prayer. And uh, <clears throat> I know it was a good prayer because he had a cat. You know, cats are very smart. They're very powerful. Cats are spiritual animals to me. And uh, cats have always known I don't like them. (laughs) And I know that. We have this relationship. But his cat, after I took that third step, it came run down the stairs, jumped right on my lap, and started rubbing his body against me like this. And I knew something was going on there. That was like a sign. And so when we got done, I asked Frank, I said, well, now what? And he reached behind his chair and he pulled out a legal pad and a ruler and a pencil. And by the time I was done, I was writing an inventory. And he showed me how to write a five-column resentment inventory, four-column fear inventory, and an 11-column sex inventory. And so he showed me how to do that. And so I started into that. I had examples from my experience on how to write them. And I wrote that inventory. When it was done, I knew it was good. And he especially warned me about dark crannies. He says, that's your secrets. That's that stuff you don't want no one to know. He said, you've got to tell that everything. And so I wrote that inventory. And I sat on it for a while. But this one Saturday, it started in the afternoon, I remember, I knew I was going to either read that to someone or go drink. You know how you get that restless? You know that one? You can, in your mind, it's like, I'll go there and get a pack of cigarettes or I'll go there and get a Pepsi. I could just see that insanity thinking. It was setting in. It was coming on strong. And I knew I either read that that night or I was going to go drink. So... In the early afternoon, I called up Frank, and I called her, and his wife told me they just took him to the hospital. He had to go there. So I kind of panicked. So I called this other guy that I knew and uh, that I trusted. and uh, He wasn't home. He didn't answer. So there's this other guy. I called him. And you know, when you're new in the program, you, you, you can't, like, you don't know how to call somebody you don't know very well and say, I want to do a fifth step, you know. So I'm dancing around with words, but this man was sober long enough to understand what was going on. And he said, do you need to do fifth step? And I said, yeah. I said, man, I do. And he said, I'll put the coffee on. He says, come on over. So I went over there. and So I had my little book. And so uh, he read the instructions for the fifth step to me. That part talked about why you do a fifth step. To get a new relationship with the Creator discover the obstacles in the path and get a new attitude. He said, that's what happens. I'm outside of it. And so uh, we started and I read my inventory and I went through it all. And Then he said to me, he said, is you, did you get everything? He says, is that it? Well, what I didn't tell him was I did dark crannies separate. I, I had them wadded up in a piece of paper and I had them in my back pocket because I wasn't so sure that I wanted to tell somebody who I didn't know Everything. I had a lot of sick sexual stuff. I stole. There was a lot of things in there that I had on there, and I didn't know if I wanted to say to any human being 
what was wrong. I could go to jail if you want. That's how I felt at that time. And so uh, I, he asked me that, and there was this voice come in my head. It says, for once, for once, do it. Just read it. And so I told him, I said, no, I got some more. And so I got that paper out, and uh, I started to read this stuff. And I really struggled. I got really sick, in a way, admitting the stuff that I had done, not just once, the stuff that I remembered that I had done. I, there was stuff I heard that I had done. I'm pretty sure what I heard. A lot of that was probably true. But I got through that. There's dark crannies, and it was done. There was nothing to my knowledge I withheld. I told it all. And so when I was done, he said, you go home, and he says, in the instructions, it says you take this book, and you first you thank God from the bottom of your heart that you know him better. And so he showed me the instructions, and then to do the review of the first five proposals. He said, I'll set by the phone. And if there's something you miss that you see, he said, you just call me. So I'll stay available to you. And so I did that. And so then they showed me in the inventory, in the sex inventory, there was a column in there that had a list of character defects. And so I was to bring that list of those character defects up to step six and seven. So I began to see where it's all interconnected. It's all interconnected with each other. And I had to do it in the exact order. And so then I took those character defects and I was shown how to look at each one and ask if I was willing to have the Creator take them. And I used to hear a lot of things in meetings about step six and seven, how people have a hard time getting it going. And I was in this meeting one time and I heard a story. And once again, through that story, I understood the simplicity of step six and seven. This guy said, he says, supposing that you're uh, going to bake a cake. He says, you get the pan, you get the flour, the sugar, and the vanilla, or whatever, and you mix it in that pan. He says, you turn the oven to 350. Then he said, you take that cake pan and you put it in that oven. And then you close the door. And he says, now that stove takes over. He says, stove will bake that cake. He said, what a lot of people do is they turn their defect over to the Creator. And then he said, it's like opening up the oven door. Well, how's it going? You close it. Well, well, is it done yet? Well, not yet. Well, I feel like shit must not have worked. He said that you that you got to leave it in there. Let the Creator bake you. He said, you turn it over and you quit peeking. And I understood what that, what that said. And I began to also understand in steps six and seven is that when that thing changes, there's a period of time... I learned this from the elders. The elders said, there is a principle that the whole universe works under. And this under the principle talks about conflict precedes clarity. In order for anything to grow or change, it must struggle to do so first. And when that struggling takes place in steps six and seven, it means it's working. It doesn't mean it's not working. So I begin to understand that. That, that very struggle is a spiritual process. It was taking me from the conflict into the clarity. And I began to see it after a little while. So then I went on and I had my list of amends that I got out of the inventory. And I took it to step eight. And the way I was taught, they said, you can look at every one of those, in step eight, every one of those names. And you need to become willing to make amends. The sorting out isn't done until step nine. That one where if you made this amend, you'd hurt someone. And so I did that. I looked at that list, and then I i don't know where I got the idea from, but when it comes time to make the amends, I made them in three categories, simple, medium, and hard. So I went and tried a couple of simple ones first, and they went really good. I said, cake, this is cake, it's no problem, I'm going to really do it. So I went to the medium column for my third amend, and I went, uh, I was taught to write out my amends, so... Because Frank said, you have a tendency to change your stories if it gets rough. The amends, so he had me circle every paragraph in the amends so I could see there's like a setup for the amends, then the financial amend, there's like a closing. If you really look at it, it's kind of cool. 
about how to pray, how to prepare yourself. So I did that. So I wrote this amend out and I went to this person and I made this amend. I made an appointment. So I sat there and I read this amend to them and this person looked at me and they said, uh, they said, is that it? I said, well, yeah. She said, that didn't have the shit you did. She said, there's a whole lot more. So I got, I got really pissed off, you know. So we got in a big fight. We started arguing. I started trying to get sober and make this amend. And she said, you didn't, you're dishonest and you and little fucking yours. And so I went back to the Frank, you know, he just shook his head. So I had to go back, like, making amends for making an amend to them. They're very humbling. There's like no mercy. Somehow, you know, she knew I was coming back. And, uh, but anyway, I went through and I made those amends. And he was very adamant that amends were made in person, wherever you can. And I remember there's some amends I couldn't, I didn't know where these people were. And he knew of a library of telephone directories in downtown Denver. They got like a library of cities all over. So I had to go down there and I had to look up and track down wherever I could, you know, these people. And I made those amends. I went through one amend I didn't. I still have the amend. It's in an envelope. It's got the stamp on it. It's sealed. I would make it, but I don't know where this person is. So I found out about the power of the amends. And then I got into step 10 and 11, those maintenance steps. And you know, I was in, I was doing step 10 and 11 probably for a couple of years, and this is what I thought how you did step 10 and 11 out of the book. I thought you opened it up and you read that. I thought you read that, and I say, yeah, I'm doing my amends, but my life wasn't changing very much. It was up and down, up and down. And it wasn't until I sat there talking with Frank one time, and I was, uh, yo-yoing so much. And I was trying to ask him about it. He said, well, how do you do it? I said, right by the book. I do it right by the book. So he said, well, I want you to sit here and show me exactly what you do. So I opened it up and I read it. And I said, that's how I do it. He said, you see when it says, you think about the 24 hours ahead? You're supposed to do that. Think about the 24 hours ahead. If your mind drops off to Saturday, you got to go, whoop, bring it back to within the 24 hours. Then when it says you ask God to direct your thinking, he said, you mean you're supposed to pray. You're supposed to say, God, direct my thinking. When it says you ask your day to be divorced from these three things, I'm supposed to pray again. Ask God to not let these three things show up. I didn't even know I was supposed to do that. When I started to do that, it started to change again. I started to grow in effectiveness. And so as we went through that, always listening to the meetings from the point of view that I'm on. And I had to learn about that pause and your irritated or doubtful pause. You know, it takes a... I can understand that part where it says we alcoholics are undisciplined. I understood that. And the 10 step. You know, I didn't know about pausing. Like if I get in a conflict with somebody, I don't think about pausing. I think like ripping their head off, telling them something, you know, remembering what they did so I can throw one back. And this guy is a friend of mine. He made me a 10-step bracelet. It was a copper bracelet, and I put it on my arm because I couldn't remember the pause. And on that bracelet, it was written, uh, the first five seconds are golden. Because I learned this about myself. And that, that step, it talks about promptly doing things. There's an advantage to doing them promptly. The way my mind goes, if I get irritated or doubtful, if I don't handle it, like pause, say in the first 10 seconds, it doesn't, that would be just a little twig. In 30 seconds, it's a tree. I mean, I'm dealing with this, like my mind can just go all over the place. So I use that bracelet to help me to remember. And I remember when I was trying to be prompt. I get in a fight with somebody, and it'd be about two hours later, I think, I look at my bracelet, and I say, remember you're supposed to pause? I mean, I just ripped him a new throat. It was too late. So I squeeze that bracelet harder. So the next time I get in a fight, when I remember, it would be like right in the middle of it. And I go to hell with it. And I just keep on going with it. But that was progress. I was getting it back. But I remember when I got to the point where 
you know where that feeling wells up when you're angry? I remember I could now bite my lip. You know, you it's like your thinking was going with it, but the lips weren't moving, and that was progress. But you, you, you know, you feel like you're all stuffed up inside. But that was improvement. It was improvement because I wasn't used to. I didn't have the habit of recognizing when you're irritated or doubtful to pause. And so I practiced that, become effective on that, which I still do today. And then got into the step 12. And exactly what happened, that, that experience that I wrote in step 2 became my experience in step 12. I could start to see that show up as part of that vision. And the way that I was taught by him was I had to go through the steps every year. A lot of people don't. But all of that's okay. But I was taught to go through the steps every year. And he said, one of the reasons that you go through the steps every year is he said, your ego works right on where you have your shit together. Right where you think you are hot. That's right where it works. And as I go through that, I begin to see that. that, that for me, that's true. It must be my makeup or whatever it is. I always discover more obstacles that I didn't see the first time through. And so I go through and I do that. And so I continue, I have done that, I've continued to go that, that walk. When I was four years sober, I put a lot of effort into it. The steps were like magic for me. They were just magic for me. And so I, I didn't, it wasn't something I had to do. I couldn't wait to do 11 steps in the morning. I began to find that was the most significant thing I could do in the course of a day. It was not to be to work on time. It was to do that 11th step, do that morning meditation and the nightly review, the 13 questions. But when I was about four years sober, I was staying a period of about 30 days. I never, it was like I had my rug of life. I had, you know, my car and I was being responsible, making car payments and showing up for work and I, I was being responsible, and it was like something come grab this edge of the rug of my life, whatever. And it's just like it upset it, and just everything went to hell. I was in trouble in my relationship, and fighting with my boss, and I didn't want to do the 11th step, and I go to meetings, stuck. I just said to who said you could sponsor somebody? I mean, I was just so judgmental and irritable. And I thought I was going nuts. And, you know, you get that fear, you're headed for a drink. And so I went up to see my friend Johnny Looking Cloud. He's the only Indian guy. He's sober a long time. And I went up to him and I, I said, I'm really in trouble. I said, whatever I had, it ain't there no more. I said, it's gone. I can't stand it. I said, I'm nuts. I said, I'm crazy. And always when I go to him, he whittles like on a piece of wood, you know. He, he just waits till I'm done. So he said, how long are you sober? Exactly, he said. So I told him for you. And he looked at me for a long time. He said, oh, he said, you're right where you're supposed to be. And you know, you hate to hear that. You know, it's like, uh, you know, there's little saying, like, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. Yes, he does. Some days he does. I'm telling you, that's a lie. You know? <laughs> or take it one day at a time. I mean, your life is falling apart. You got, you take it one day at a time. I can't stand it, you know? But then what he showed me, he said, he said, how, he said, the reason these are principles and why they work so well, he said, he said, the whole universe, it runs by a set of principle, laws, and values. Every bird, every salmon, every tree, it all runs by those. He said, we human beings, we live on this Mother Earth. And he said, the tree goes in cycles. The salmon go in cycles. The geese go in cycles. He said, we too. We're just like them. He said, in a human being, he said, we travel in a four-year cycle. He said, like an oak tree. The oak tree is out there, looks dead. Then he said, all of a sudden, this life force starts to flow in that oak tree. And when you look at it, it looks dead. But it isn't. Once that life force starts, then pretty soon, that branch, as it starts to bud, he said, that's the first year in sobriety. Then the second year, he says, those buds unfold. When you finally start to see a shape of who you are, you start to sense what this walk is about. Then he said, you come into your third year and that's like a harvest year. You've got 
fruits and yellow leaves and nuts. And he said, and the third year is always good. Then he said, one day, just like the oak tree is standing out there, and it is so beautiful, and it is all together. He said, I'm in the groove. You can do nothing wrong. And it's not that you don't get flat tires, you do, but get them right in front of the gas station. See, it's fall season. It's right there. But one day, the temperature changes a little bit, gust of wind comes along, goes and starts to blow those leaves away. And at first, the oak tree is positive thinking by now. And so, well, the Lord give us and the Lord take us. I have a lot of leaves. It's no problem. Of course, in a week or so later, wind changes a little bit, gust of wind comes along, blows more of the leaves away. About half the leaves are gone now. And he said, this would be in sobriety too. Well, I just go to more meetings. I'll call my sponsor and I'll read the book more. He says, then inside there you sense something is, is falling apart. And he says, so you're still trying to be positive. So you're trying to tell everybody, oh, it's okay. It's okay. I'm, 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 I'm resilient. I'll bounce back. But inside by now is what you're thinking to yourself is shit. Because you know something is going on. And pretty soon all the leaves blow away. And he said, that's a winter time of sobriety. It happens. He said, it'll happen again seven to eight. Happen again 11 to 12. Happen again 15 to 16. You go in a circle or a cycle. And he said, what those leaves are, that's your belief. That's the things that you think are true. It's the things you figured out. Gain confidence in. Have faith in. And he said, nature, in order to make the thing grow to its next thing, it always destroys the beauty of the fall. And it says the Creator causes your belief to shift. Then for... That winter time, there's three questions that you cannot ask. One is, why am I? So you'll start to say, what's my purpose? You know, what's my purpose, grasshopper, or whatever? You know, you're, <laughs> you're trying to find it out. And the second thing you can't answer is, who am I? You say, I don't know who I am anymore. Remember? Then the third, you don't know where you're going. But he said, that's, a, that's the way it is. So he showed me how to work the steps. Three years, you work the steps like this. The fourth year, you work them a little bit different. He said, fourth year, when you come into that step, he said, you got to put everything on the altar. you got to put your sponsor on the altar. See, because he said you develop in three years, what you develop is pocket God. You get in trouble, go to a meeting. Meeting saves my ass. Get in trouble, go to your sponsor. Sponsor saves my rear. You feel like drinking, you'll go here. He said, none of those things saves you. Only trust in God keeps you sober. So you got to put the big book on the altar, the sponsor, the meeting. Put it all on there. And just trust in God. You see, that's how you go through that fourth step, fourth year. Just trusting in God. Then all those things come back to you new. He even says, get a new big book every four years. Don't use the old one. You got all marked up. Get you a new one. Because you got to see different things in there. And so that's what I learned. And I remember I was driving back from talking to him and I was driving out old road back from Denver to Colorado Springs. And all of a sudden I started crying. And I didn't cry because everything was going to be okay. I cried because I knew I wasn't enough. God wasn't mad. I had done nothing wrong. I was just in winter. And so I learned it that way. A few years later, I took these 12 steps to the Indian elders because... By that time, I started to come back to my culture. I was going to AA and I felt I had one box and and two different logs. It wasn't the same. So I took these 12 steps to them. And I said, I said, I need some advice. I said, I feel I'm walking two roads. I said, but I got these 12 steps from Alcoholics Anonymous. But on here, I do ceremonies and I do other things I am learning to do. So they said, come explain these 12 steps. They said, we don't know what they are. So they formed a circle and I went in there and the best that I could, I explained each of those 12 proposals. And they said, they said, no, they said, that that's not a white man's way. They said, it's the same way we do it. It's not two paths, it's one. It's the same. This is how we did it. The ancestors all did it. Examination and growth, that same way. They said, the only thing that we would do different if we were to change anything, was to put the steps in a circle. So they said you take those first three steps and you put them in the east part of the circle, like new sun, new day. 
And they said, of the four directions, that's the direction about finding God or the Creator. Then they said, step four, five, six, you put in the south. That's where you find yourself. Seven, eight, nine, in the west. When you make amends, you now find your relations. Finding your relatives. Your relationships are reestablished. 10, 11, 12, in the north. That's the direction of the elders, the maintenance of those elders. And so that's what we did. We put the steps in a circle. Then as we got them to help us, we started to find out about the ceremonies with each of the steps. So before we go into a set of steps, like what they say, when you go to another set of steps, don't go back to step one. They say go forward to step one. Step into the mystery. See if it will work again. Don't go back. Go forward to the steps. So we do a staking ceremony before we go into the steps again doing that work. Step three, we take that bow with the sacred pipe. We call the chinupa. Step five, we do in the sweat lodge. Some of you may know what it is, but it's a, it's a sweat lodge that they put the hot rocks in there. And then step six and seven, once we get the character defects, we make tobacco ties, little red cloth. And you take tobacco and you Tobacco is used for spiritual prayer. And you put your defect in that tobacco. You ask the Creator to take it and you make a tobacco tie. One tie for each of the defects. Then you go back in a sweat lodge. And you get in there and then the helpers come. And when you take that tobacco tie, they pray and they're singing. Old, old songs, the power songs. And then you take that tobacco tie and you throw it on those hot rocks. And it will sit there and all of a sudden just burst into flames with then you take the next tobacco tie, the next defect of character, and you put it in there. And so we were taught how to make it the same path. It wasn't different. That's how they did it in the old days. So everything is one for me now. Today is um, I uh, I run a nonprofit organization called White Bison, where we work with with the alcoholism in Indian communities. Our goal is to have 100 communities in healing by the year 2010. Alcohol is a big problem in Indian country. And so we go there, and we have this hoop that has 100 eagle feathers on it now. It was born shortly after that white buffalo calf was born. So what we do now is we're creating in the native communities a movement. We study the civil rights movement. How did that man, Dr. King, Get all these people to show up. And that Gandhi, how the heck did they do that? So we studied about that and with the elders. And so now we're making a thing called a well-bridey movement, not sobriety. We, we got this word from an Indian word, but we had to combine two words in English because you can't always translate back and forth. We didn't want to say sobriety because see, if you're a jerk and you're drinking, you just quit drinking. So we had to find a different word. Because we wanted this wholeness, the wellness, emotional, mental, physical, spiritual, all of that. We wanted it all in that word. And so we started making this well variety movement. We took this sacred hoop. First we went to the Onondaga Nation and we traveled to all the tribal colleges, 32 colleges across the United States. And we talked about having a ceremony in each of these places and making this well variety movement. Thousands showed up and started talking about it's time we get sober. Then last April 2nd, we took this sacred hoop to the Los Angeles. And we run that hoop across the United States from Los Angeles to the White House. 4,294 miles. And we asked, we call that walk the wiping of the tears. You know, the trail of tears. Because the elders said, it's time to quit crying. We've got to wipe those tears. And the elders put into this hoop four powers at a ceremony by the white buffalo calf. First was the powers to forgive the unforgivable because they said that's what for us to come together we've got to forgive one another. The second powers they put in was unity. The third was healing. The fourth was hope. And so we made that run across the The youngest was 16. The oldest was 81. That 16 year old was my daughter. She made that run. And it was a hard run and we run for the people. We run for the movement. And sometimes we have 300 people show up, 500 people. We were fed, everything was taken care of. And so that's sort of where uh, these steps 
how the Creator has allowed me to do things I never in my whole life ever, ever, ever thought in any way, shape, or form that I would do something like today. I just have to pinch myself sometimes. Say, Mom, is this real? Is this really going on? But you told me it would. That's what you guys said. You said if I go to meetings, if I ask for a day of sobriety, thank Him at night, work the steps the best that I could, you said great things will start to happen. That's the way it's been. It's been very, very good. I'll just close with this. When I first got sober that first year, I was they had restrictions on me being able to see my children. Then the second year I would go there and then but they would leave. They hide dad and psh, out the door they would go. Third year I had sober Christmas. It was the first time in a, they went with me shopping, Christmas shopping, got my car and I took them to a store and uh, when we come back from the store I was helping them carry the packages up on the steps. And I got up there and it got that quiet time and my oldest son. He dropped his packages down, and he looked at me and he said he said, I love you, Dad. And he gave me this big hug. Then my second son did it. And my third, my daughter, Summer. She also gave me that big hug. And it took a long time to repair that. Even on that walk, my daughter, Terry, we had a lot of talks on that walk, laying in this tent at night. And we didn't stay in a hotel. We ran, slept in the desert, all of that. But today I have four grandchildren. This one on the way. They let me take those grand. They let me take those grandbabies. They don't call, check them here, nothing. I take those little critters, and because <laughs> I got one goal with my grandchildren, is I want to hear them say, "This is what Grandpa said." That's what I want them to do. This is what Grandpa said, because you don't hear that too much anymore. And I remember the other day I was up there eating with him and his mom told him something. He said, Grandpa wouldn't like that. This is what Grandpa said. <laughs> and that's the recovery. That's what I think what this is about. And so uh, I just do it one day at a time. I feel like I'm walking in the minefield of miracles. It's just the way my life breaks. It's in the miracle. I just watch them happen all the time. Commonplace, normal, natural. I think if I were to choose the worst thing in my drinking, all that boxing match, if I was to, all the list of the bad things that went on, if I was to choose the worst, I would pick the loneliness. You know that one? You guys know. That's just so cool. You don't have to explain it. You know what I mean. That hole. And what I found out still that was I was really looking for a contact with the Creator. That's what I was looking for. If I were to pick the best thing of all the gifts I've gotten from this program, it's the relationship that I have with Tankashala, the great mystery, my God. Common sense, practical. I never, even a second, a moment, for years, have ever felt abandoned by God or God left. I don't live that kind of life. It doesn't matter what happened, what's going on, I never have that feeling God left. It just hasn't, it doesn't happen. It's always there, no matter what. So that's the greatest gift that you give me. I remember one time when I was drinking, I went home to my own tribe. And I was drinking, doing some things I shouldn't have been doing, and they asked me to leave. And they said to me, they said, don't you ever come back here. You go. Sometime later, I end up with you. No matter what I did, you guys said, keep coming back. No matter what I did, you said, keep coming back. Keep coming back. So if I had to choose between my own tribe and you, I would pick you. Because you said, come back. You understood more than what they did. And so, that's what I do. I just make you my tribe. I have that feeling of belonging. It's like a clan, you know. I know I can come here total stranger. Three hours, we're friends. 
five hours we have man talk, you know. It's just really cool. So I'll just close with this prayer I got from you too. But in this prayer it says, God, thank you for what you've given me. God, thank you for what you've taken from me. And God, thank you for what you've left me. And what I got left with was these sacred steps. You, my tribe. And I, I know you'll always say, keep coming back no matter what I do. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.